Welcome attendees. My name is Michelle and I'll be presenting Beyond the Nuchal, getting the most from the 11 to 14 week ultrasound. I have no conflicts of interest. Due to time limitations and to maintain the quality of content, this talk will be specifically on fetal anatomy and some pathologies. The late first trimester scan between 11 weeks and 13 weeks, six days should be viewed as the limited detail anatomy scan. Improvement of ultrasound machines allows better imaging to detect major and some minor fetal abnormalities. This scan allows for aneuploid screening with the measurement of the nuchal translucency. It confirms or establishes the estimated due date and provides patient reassurance. The nuchal translucency measurement is the fluid collection behind the fetal neck that screens for aneuploidies and other chromal conditions as well as congenital heart defects. Sonographers need to be trained and submit a yearly audit through the Fetal Medicine Foundation to maintain their certification. Nuchal translucency, maternal age, and blood work constitutes the first trimester combined screening. NIPT analyzes maternal blood work to detect for chromosomal abnormalities, including aneuploidies. It provides an alternative for patients wanting to pay or are eligible for NIPT through referral. As technology improves and cost of genetic testing decreases, NIPT will be able to screen for more genetic conditions and become available for more pregnant women. With an increase in women who have received NIPT, the NT measurement for detect detection of aneuploidies alone has limited utility. This means more sonographers can perform the late first trimester scan without NT training. As a result, quality assurance between sonographers and different imaging sites should be established, and the introduction of advanced fetal images should be added to protocols for general sonographers. The mid-sagittal nuchal translucency image will continue to remain, as the structures assessed in this image provide significant diagnostic value for detecting aneuploidies and fetal anomalies such as heart defects. Currently, the required images include the biometry, heart rate, placenta, subjective assessment of the AFI, nuchal translucency, adnexa, ovaries, and basic anatomy. Protocols vary at different sites, but the basic anatomy usually includes the cranium, choroids, profile, heart situs, stomach, cord insertion, bladder, and extremities. It should expand to include assessment of the three vessel cord, the mid sagittal profile of the nasal bone, palate, maxilla, mandible, and forehead, the thorax, four chamber heart, outflows, three vessel view, coronal face, orbits, kidneys, and spine, with all images at least attempted. In certain situations, you should include further images and assessment. These include a confirmed or suspected fetal anomaly, nuchal edema, prior history of fetal anomaly, exposure to teratogenic agents, maternal torch infections, and certain maternal medical conditions. I will be discussing most of these advanced views and images throughout my presentation today. Image optimization was discussed this morning, but I want to reinforce that focus, zoom, sector width gains, and TGCs need to be adjusted continually throughout the scan. Both hands need to be working hard. In the first trimester, it is ideal to lower the dynamic range so the image appears more contrasty. This also assists in cardiac and skeletal imaging. The best approach to scanning is a balance between being an opportunistic versus a methodical scanner, and time is always an issue. The most difficult and critically important images should be attempted first. The mid-sagittal profile view with the emphasis on the NT measurement and nasal bone should be imaged as soon as possible. Following that, images should be prioritized based on abnormalities and fetal position. Be efficient and mindful of your patient's comfort. The mid-sagittal brain and face image has the highest priority as it allows assessment of the nuchal translucency, nasal bone, intracranial translucency, palate, mandible, and forehead. It is a difficult image to obtain as it depends on fetal position. The criteria for obtaining a quality nuchal translucency is very specific, so be mindful of all the necessary parameters when taking this image. Ensure the image is mid-sagittal, zoomed up to only include the head and thorax, the head is neutral, calipers are placed on to on, the amnion is seen with the fetus off the membrane, and the maximum width is measured. 
at least three measurements of similar size should be obtained with the largest measurement used. There are a few neck abnormalities you may see in the first trimester. A nuchal translucency measurement of 3.5 or greater is considered nuchal edema and is abnormal. The etiology can be chromosomal, genetic, structural, as in a congenital heart defect or normal. A cystic hygroma is symmetrical cystic structures within the posterior neck and occiput. It is classified as an increased nuchal translucency. Etiologies are chromosomal or genetic and most lead to high drops. Dilated jugular sacs are seen on either side of the neck and the nuchal translucency can be normal. They are due to the variation in timing of lymphangiogenesis, are isolated and usually resolve. The most common neck tumor is a teratoma. Teratomas can be seen in the anterior or posterior neck. Babies with aneuploidies have absent, small, or hypoplastic nasal bones, so assessment adds to the screening accuracy of the first trimester screen. Exercise caution prior to 12 weeks if the nasal bone appears absent or hypoplastic. The recommendation is to bring the patient back after 12 weeks to reassess the nasal bone and repeat the nuchal translucency measurement and first trimester screen. The correct view of the nasal bone includes three echogenic lines. The very top line is the nasal tip, the next line is the skin, and the bottom line is the nasal bone, which should be thicker and brighter than the skin line above it. The first image shows an absent nasal bone where the bottom line is not seen at all. The second image shows a hypoplastic nasal bone, which is not as bright as the skin and nasal tip above it. The intracranial translucency or ICT is the fourth ventricle. It is the anechoic area here, located between the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle here and the brainstem. There should be a visible hyperechoic line separating them. In an open spina bifida, the ICT is obliterated or absent. The image on the left shows a normal or present ICT, and the image on the right shows an absent ICT, which is an indicator for open spina bifida. The palate can be assessed from the mid-sagittal profile view. A marker for cleft lip and palate is the maxillary gap, seen as a break in the echogenic palate. The palate should be assessed in all fetuses, but especially if you are seeing other signs to include a chromosomal abnormality or genetic syndrome, as cleft lip and palate can be associated with it. The fetus on the left has a maxillary gap compared to the one on the right, which is a normal intact palate. A maxillary gap is not only seen in the center of the palate. The palate can appear absent in the anterior only portion, the posterior only portion, or anterior and posterior. So not only look for a gap in the central portion of the palate, but also look for a shortened or small palate. The bulging of tissue in the mid maxillary region can be another indicator of cleft lip and palate. So if you see this redundant tissue, assess for a maxillary gap. The coronal view of the palate is the retronasal triangle, or RNT view. The retronasal triangle is a coronal image of the most anterior aspect of the primary and secondary palate at the level of the nasal bones. It looks like a triangle with the very top tip of it formed by the two nasal bones, the sides by the frontal process of the maxilla, and the bottom by the palate. Attempt the RNT view when you see a maxillary gap or bulging of the upper lip or another fetal anomaly such as holoprosencephaly, nuchal edema, or micrognathia. For the next three slides, I have included a normal profile and retronasal triangle image at the top. The bottom image on this slide shows a profile with bulging tissue above the lip and a bilateral gap in the palate of the RNT view, seen here and here. Here is an example of a maxillary gap in the sagittal view. Hydrops and nuchal edema is also seen. In the RNT view, there is absence of the palate and frontal process of the left maxilla. The baby on the bottom has holoprosencephaly, 
the nasal bone is absent on the sagittal and RNT view, and there is irregular configuration of the maxilla and palate in the RNT view. This is quite abnormal. The retro nasal triangle view can also assess the presence of the nasal bones. The nasal bones are considered present when only one of the bilateral nares are seen in the RNT view. So if you are seeing only one of these, this one or this one, that's fine. The chin can also be appreciated from the mid sagittal profile view. An undersized lower jaw is mandibular hypoplasia and can be classified as micrognathia, meaning short mandible, or retrognathia, which is backwards displacement of the mandible. This can be isolated or seen in aneuploidies, triploidy, or syndromes. For the general obstetrical sonographer, mandibular hypoplasia is a subjective assessment in the mid sagittal face view. However, if you are questioning micrognathia, I challenge all sonographers to attempt the RNT view as the mandible can be appreciated inferiorly. The normal appearance has a mandibular gap here. So you should see one mandible here and another one here. The gap will be absent and the mandible, mandible will appear fused when there is micrognathia. The mid-sagittal profile view allows assessment of the forehead. If there appears to be frontal bossing or a flat face, there is a quantitative measurement that can be performed. The frontal maxillary facial angle is the intersection or angle of the lines traversing the anterior palate and the frontal bones. So if you draw a line here and here where the lines intersect forms an angle, the normal angle is approximately 75 to 90 degrees. Babies with trisomy 21 and 18 have an increased frontal maxillary facial angle over 90 degrees due to posterior displacement of the palate. Babies with an open spina bifida will have a decrease in the frontal maxillary facial angle less than 75 degrees due to caudal displacement of the forehead caused by leakage of cerebral spinal fluid. The yellow star here and here notes the absent ICT. After assessment of the sagittal brain and face, I zoom out and obtain a quality crown rump length measurement with the baby in a neutral position with the cranial and caudal edges appreciated well. The crown rump length determines the gestational age, which can impact the due date. So ensure you optimize your image appropriately. This is also when I take a cute photo of the baby for the parents to put on the fridge. These are both acceptable crown rump length images that have been optimized well with the baby in a neutral position. These are not. The first two images at the top are too curled up and the bottom image is too stretched out and the borders are unclear. This is unacceptable. After I have assessed the mid sagittal face and crown rump length, I do a transverse sweep through the baby. This is when I develop an approach for how to perform the remainder of the exam. Any abnormality seen now takes priority. If the baby appears normal, my image order is based on what is easiest to see. This is also when I may have my patient empty some in their bladder if they're not tolerating the scan well. For the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to discuss images and anatomy mostly from head to bump. The landmarks for the transverse BPD and head circumference are the midline thalami and falcs. Measure the BPD from outer to inner calvarium and the head circumference outer calvarium only. Ensure the skull appears oval. If the head appears lemon shaped, this could be an indicator for an open neural tube defect. Image the spine closely and also see if the ICT is obliterated. If the cerebellum appears small, absent, or banana shaped, you should suspect Arnold Chiari malformation. A lemon shaped head is not specific for Arnold Chiari malformation, but a banana shaped cerebellum is. Another sign of an open neural tube defect is the crash sign. The crash sign is posterior displacement of the mesencephalon against the occipital bone. In the diagram, the mesencephalon represents the car. So this is the mesencephalon. And the occiput here is represented by the wall here. 
with an open neural tube defect, the posterior brains crash into the occiput or wall. The aqueduct of Sylvius here is an easily identifiable cystic structure located within the mesencephalon that is seen to shift posteriorly towards the occiput when there is an open neural tube defect. Acrania is a neural tube defect where the upper portion does not close completely, resulting in an absent cranium. Anencephaly is when no neural tissue is seen, and exencephaly is when some brain tissue is seen dangling. Exencephaly leads to anencephaly, as this tissue is sloughed off. The choroid plexus are hyperechoic oblong structures that fill almost the entire space within the lateral ventricles. A heterogeneous appearance at this gestation is considered normal. CPCs can be seen in the first trimester. True CPCs must be three millimeters in three planes. Holoprosencephaly is incomplete separation of the two brain hemispheres. There are four types, but only a lobar and semilobar are appreciated within the first trimester. A lobar, holoprosencephaly, is complete fusion of the hemispheres with a dilated monoventricle. With semilobar, cerebral hemispheres and ventricles are fused anteriorly, but they are separated posteriorly. So a thinner monoventricle is only seen in the anterior brain. Holoprosencephaly is associated with facial abnormalities, so assess the face closely. Another type of brain defect is an encephalocele, which is herniation of a brain-filled cyst through a defect in the skull. Etiologies include aneuploides and Meckel-Gruber syndrome. When assessing the face straight on coronally, look for symmetry, size, and presence of the facial bones. Attempt the transverse view of the orbits and lenses if you are able. Most facial abnormalities have associations with other fetal defects. So if you see any defects with associated face anomalies, assess the face carefully. A proboscis is a trunk-like appendage associated with an absent nose. Etiologies include holoprosencephaly, trisomy 13 and 18. Babies with a proboscis often have cyclopia, which is a single orbit. Hypotellurism is a decrease in interorbital distance seen in aneuploidies such as holoprosencephaly, Meckel-Gruber, and microcephaly. Hypertellurism is an increase in interorbital distance or wide set eyes. When assessing the heart, try to obtain a four chamber view and assess for levocardia, cardia, situs solidus, balance chambers, and size approximately a third of the chest. If you are able, you should attempt the LVOT, RVOT, three vessel view, and a dual image of the outflows crossing. Ensure no obvious masses or structural defects are seen. Several major cardiac abnormalities can be seen in the first trimester. It is not the expectation that a general sonographer will understand all the cardiac abnormalities. So if you are questioning a congenital heart defect, do your best to image the four chamber, LVOT, RVOT, and three vessel view. Take a video clip and consult with the radiologist or perinatologist. If you are questioning a heart defect, a color Doppler and pulse wave Doppler assessment of the ductus venosus can support a diagnosis. The ductus venosus is a shunt that allows blood from the umbilical vein to bypass the liver and drain into the superior IVC, which goes directly into the right atrium. The ductus venosus assessment in the first trimester requires special training and certification through the Fetal Medicine Foundation. The process is similar to obtaining nuchal translucency accreditation. Heart defects can have associations with an absent ductus venosus or abnormal connections of the ductus venosus. I recently viewed a talk through the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine by Dr. Alfred Abu Hamid, who presented these images showing that in the first trimester, it is possible to visualize varied connections of the ductus venosus. So for reference, this is the normal ductus venosus. These are both absent ductus venosus. So here you see the umbilical vein draining directly into the mid IVC. And then here, the umbilical vein is draining directly into the right atrium of the heart. 
Dr. Abu Hamid also presented this slide showing that in the presence of aneuploidies, the ductus venosus has a direct connection to the IVC. The ductus venosus pulse wave is a triphasic forward flow waveform, which involves assessment of the A wave. In the normal setting, the A wave reflects the atrial kick as positive when the pressure in the right atrium is normal. When the normal function of the heart is affected, it causes an increase in pressure in the right atrium. This prevents forward flow during atrial contraction, which is seen as an absent or reversed A wave. This occurs during heart defects. Aneuploidies have an association with heart defects. A limitation of the ductus venosus waveform alone is that it cannot differentiate between pathologies. When taking an M mode of the heart rate, make sure that your 2D image has been zoomed up and sectored down to include only the heart. Make sure to increase your sweep speed to increase the accuracy of the heart rate. A normal fetal heart rate is 140 to 169 beats per minute in the first trimester. A heart rate of 170 or above is considered tachycardia and can be an indicator of an aneuploidy or genetic syndrome. Make sure the fetal heart rate has been optimized and perform three different M modes at different times to confirm. When checking situs, ensure heart and stomach are on the same side on the left to rule out situs inversus, ambiguous, and heterotaxy. Dual the screen and label left side in both of your images. The stomach should be assessed for presence, size, and location in the transverse plane. Assessment of the diaphragm can be done in a single coronal image or in two sagittal images labeled right diaphragm and left diaphragm. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia is when stomach, liver, and or bowel protrudes into the chest through a defect in the diaphragm. A medial stinal shift may be seen. The size of the defect determines the severity. Etiologies include chromosomal and genetic. When looking at the fetal pelvis, note the brightness of the bowel. Echogenic bowel is defined as as bright as bone, so turn your gaze down and determine which disappears first. It can be a normal isolated finding or be associated with genetic or chromosomal anomalies, cystic fibrosis, fetal infections, or maternal bleeding. The cord insertion resembles an equal sign in the transverse mid to lower abdomen. Turn the gains up to see it better. Doppler significantly increases power and the risk of potential bile effects, and it is not considered a routine image at every imaging site. You should assess if it is included in the protocol, there is a ventral wall defect or cord abnormality, or you're questioning an aneuploidy. Keep your color box small, scale low, color gains up, and use power Doppler if necessary. A two vessel cord can be isolated or associated with trisomy 18, renal, or cardiac anomalies. There are several umbilical cord or ventral wall defects you can see in the first trimester. A mid-gut hernia is the normal development of the GI tract, which is situated outside the abdomen. Most resolve at 11 weeks, but some will persist until the 12th week. They are heterogeneous and measure 4 to 7 millimeters. An unphalocele is encased by viscera and can contain bowel, liver, stomach, and other abdominal organs. It is homogeneous with the cord arising from the sac. They are over 7 millimeters, and etiologies include chromosomal, cardiac, a neural tube, or genital urinary defect. When differentiating between a mid-gut hernia and an unphalocele, correlate with the crown rump length. Although most resolve by 11 weeks, a mid-gut hernia can persist up to a crown rump length of approximately 56 millimeters, which is about 12 weeks. An unphalocele is associated with other abnormalities and has a poor prognosis, so exercise caution when the baby is less than 12 weeks. The recommendation is to have a patient return into the 12th week to reassess. Gastroschisis is the herniation of free-floating bowel. It is typically to the right of the cord insertion and borders are irregular. Ectopia cordis is when the heart is outside the chest. Cantology of Cantrell has five features, but it is essentially an emphalocele and ectopia cordis together.
body stock anomaly has a short or absent cord and multiple anomalies including defects of the thorax, cranium, face, spine, and extremities. Bladder extrophy is when the bladder develops outside the pelvis. Cloacal extrophy is referred to as OEIS complex, which is unphallocele, extrophy of the bladder and rectum, imperforate anus, and spinal complex. The normal bladder is less than seven millimeters and can be difficult to see, so assess throughout the scan. It is in the same plane as the umbilical vessels, so use color Doppler to assist you. If it is not seen throughout the scan, image the fetal pelvis and label bladder area. Kidneys are slightly echogenic, reniform shaped, and located in the lower abdomen on either side of the lumbar spine. They are best imaged in the coronal plane in the first trimester. The transverse plane with the spine up allows the best assessment of the renal pelvises. Use color Doppler if an abnormality is suspected. The most common abnormalities of the bladder in the first trimester include bladder extrophy, which has already been discussed, and megacystis, which is an enlarged bladder. Posterior urethral valves is when there is an obstructing membrane in the posterior urethral valve of a male fetus. Features include severe bilateral uropathy and hydronephrosis, and dilation of the bladder over 15 millimeters into the characteristic keyhole sign. This is the most common cause of lower urinary tract obstruction. Kidney abnormalities have associations with other fetal defects, so assess closely if you are seeing other fetal anomalies. Abnormalities you may appreciate is severe hydronephrosis with or without pileactasis, hyperechoic enlarged kidneys, unilateral or renal agenesis, and large cysts or tumors. Upper and lower limb assessment include images of all three segments of the long bones, hands, and feet. Assess the long bones for presence, symmetry, echogenicity, and if they are straight. Angles of the limbs should be 90 degrees to each other. While assessing and imaging the limbs, ensure that movement of all limbs is seen as a fixed or immobile limb is an abnormality. The humerus, radius, ulna, and hands of both upper limbs must be imaged. The transverse view of the upper limbs at the fetal thorax or abdomen is preferred. In a sagittal view, you could potentially image the same arm twice if the baby is really busy. More than one image may be necessary. Make sure to label accordingly. The same pr principles also apply when you are imaging the lower limbs. Feet can be assessed in the lower limb leg image. Try to image the foot bottom and assess for abnormal configuration or an extra or missing digit. Ensure the ankles are not rotated in alignment with the tibia and fibula to rule out a club foot. Exercise caution when calling a foot clubbed as babies normally rotate their feet inwards. Fetuses open their hands frequently in the first trimester, so attempt to image them. This allows the best assessment of the hands for any abnormalities. Etiologies of limb anomalies can be isolated, chromosomal, genetic, or part of a skeletal dysplasia, so look closely at them if you are seeing multiple fetal anomalies. When assessing the limb for abnormalities, pay attention to absent, asymmetric, short, or bowed limbs. Also ensure the thorax size is appropriate, as a small thorax is an indicator of a skeletal dysplasia. This baby has Meckel-Gruber syndrome, the hands were clenched and there was bowing and shortening of the long bones. Here is an example of an absent limb, the radius. These are webbed or conjoined digits. This is an example of a claw-like extremity. When assessing the spine, it must be imaged in the sagittal plane with the baby looking down and away from the uterine wall to assess for intact skin and regularity of vertebrae. Scan the spine in transverse from head to sacrum, looking for abnormalities and image at the sacrum. The spine may need to be imaged in sections. Major spinal defects seen in the first trimester will often be in conjunction with other abnormalities, so assess closely if you are seeing associated fetal anomalies. Small, isolated spinal defects are difficult to appreciate in the first trimester. Just a reminder that an open spina bifida may have a lemon-shaped skull, absent ICT, 
a banana-shaped cerebellum, and the crash sign. So look closely at the spine for irregularity and a mass to an open defect if you are seeing any of these. A sacrococcygeal teratoma is a mass of variable size and echogenicity in the caustics or sacrum. It may appear similar to an open spina bifida, but without any brain abnormalities. Here is an example of extreme retroflexion and distortion of the spine. This is an extremely abnormal curvature of the spine. Serenomelia involves sacral agenesis and partial or complete fusion of the lower extremities. As I'm nearing the end of my presentation, I want to discuss an important case study. The following case study is of a patient who was seen at 12, 14, 15, 16 weeks, and then at her detailed ultrasound at 18 weeks. She had a complicated prenatal history, so weekly follow-up appointments were recommended. These are images seen at 12 weeks and three days at the first trimester screen. The brain appears normal, the, the mid-sagittal face is appropriate, and no obvious fetal defects were seen. However, the spine was not imaged. The patient returned at 14 weeks one day and further images were taken. Again, fetal anatomy appears appropriate. Here are just a couple of images I have showing a normal brain and beautiful four chamber heart, indicating the skill of the sonographer, but no spine images were performed. This is the baby at 15 weeks and one day. The face and the brain look normal. At the level of the femur and cord insertion, you can kind of see the transverse lower back and sacrum, but no dedicated spine images were taken. These are a few images at 16 weeks and one day showing a part of the transverse lower back in the bladder image and the sagittal view of the bum in the leg image. In the transverse three vessel cord view, I did question if this was in fact the, the spinal defect, but it is hard to tell because again, no spine images were done. And then bam. This is the spine two weeks later at 18 weeks when the patient returned for her normal detailed anatomical ultrasound. This is a large closed neural tube defect of fairly substantial size. Currently, the spine is not considered a routine image in the first trimester, but because of this example, it should be. Although it is difficult to see small or closed spinal defects in the first trimester, we will never know if this spinal defect could have been seen earlier than 18 weeks as an acceptable spine picture was not performed until the detailed scan. Even though I knew this case study was going to put me over my allotted time, I had to include it because it is such a power, powerful example of how we miss the things we do not look for and the reason why we need to establish a set protocol for first trimester required images. So just to really drive this point home, Images such as these cannot rule out a spinal defect as the skin line is not appreciated. In order to assess the spine completely, it has to be imaged spine up and away from the uterine wall to assess for any visible defect in the spine and skin line. In closing, start appreciating unfamiliar structures in your images, such as the intracranial translucency, aqueduct of sylvius, and the palate. Add new images systematically, perfecting one image before adding in another one. Normal is always your strength. Question anything that seems unusual. Image in at least two planes. Take a video clip and consult with the radiologist or perinatologist. Image quality is directly related to the ability to appreciate fetal abnormalities in the first trimester. Ensure all your images have been optimized. Thank you for your attention. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Michelle. That's a, it was an amazing presentation. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a it's a lot of information, and I know that it's uh, yeah, it's uh, and Michelle knows this area so well. This was her um, her edited version. Um, 
but you know uh some comments saying is this mfm level yeah for for much of it it is for sure um but um at the same time you know we want you to challenge yourself so that when you are doing that you know 13 12 13 week ultrasound to really say you know what can i get with this ultrasound and you know my feeling is this there will be in the future there will be a standard um that certainly um will be requiring a lot more anatomy uh, in the late first trimester. So start challenging yourself now. So um, again, because there is a lot of information, I know uh, people want to hear it again. This will be available on the YouTube channel, which you will get information uh, out soon. It just uh, the videos are going to be just edited slightly um, to take out all my bad jokes. And then um, you'll be able to view and uh, you know stop it, re uh, rewind all of that. So OK, so Michelle, how much? Yes. I just want to say that, yes, some of this was a little bit MFM level. However, for the general sonographer, the reason why I presented some of these um, structures, such as the ICT, the aqueduct of Silvius, uh, the palate, it's because general sonographers are already imaging these things. They just aren't recognizing it in some of these pictures. So anyone who does the nuchal translucency scan these structures are already in those pictures. Now it's just bringing your awareness to them and making sure they're there, they're present, and they look normal. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. It's um, more so with the first trimester, but I think even at other ultrasounds, you know, we'll get a referral um, or I'll be reviewing an image and you go back and the anomaly is clearly there, there on the picture. And that's mm -hmm. the difference between understanding the fetal anatomy and evaluating the fetus versus just being a fetal photographer. So I think that's another message is, you know, that's that we've talked about today. Okay, recognizing that, how much time do you allocate for the nuchal translucency exam? So that is going to vary. Um, I think most sites give 30 to 45 minutes, but it depends on which site you're working at. Yeah, for sure. Um, and recognizing things like um, fetal position obviously can make things exceptionally challenging. Um, yeah. You know, uh, maternal sound characteristics, the skill of the sonographer. Yeah. There's a question here. How do you determine the difference between micronathia versus retronathia? The answers I can answer that one is that uh, really don't uh, in the first trimester don't just consider them um, synonymous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay. And then um, is uh, is it an, is it important important to measure the nasal bone? Is there a standard measurement, or is it just the um, uh, subjective presence? So there is a normal measurement in the first trimester. It's one to two millimeters, which correlates with the crown rump length or gestational age. However, you know what? If you are just seeing the presence of the nasal bone as bright as the nasal tip and the skin line, that is sufficient. You do not need to be measuring the, the nasal bone in the first trimester unless you're at a maternal fetal medicine site. And that is part of the protocol or you're questioning something and the uh, radiologist or perinatologist wants you to measure it. So yeah. I don't think you should be measuring it unless you are at a maternal fetal medicine site and that's part of the protocol. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna agree, but say no. There's really not a whole lot of value of measuring in the first trimester. Um, second trimester, I, I appreciate there's normal values for the detailed ultrasound, um, but again, the nasal bone in itself it is a very strong association. Its absence or hypoplastic with um, fetal. Uh, trisomy 21, but hopefully as NIPT becomes more of a standard of care, then really there's going to be less um, emphasis on um, the nuchal uh, and also the nasal bone itself outside mm -hmm. of the nuchal being enlarged and a marker for, for other issues. Um, a question, this is a good one. Would seeing the spinal defect earlier than 18 weeks change the treatment plan for the patient? You can answer that or I can answer that. I feel like I can answer that. I'm not going to, this is not fair of me to take over all your questions though. I'm going to well, give you, so yes. In terms of the management from a sonographic perspective, you know, that's really up to the physician to decide. That's, that's where the radiologist and the perinatologist determines how to manage that case. So, you know what, I, I could probably answer that question, but I don't think I should answer that question because I'm a sonographer and I talk to the radiologist and the perinatologist about that. So 
If you yeah. want to answer that, feel free. I think I will. Um, so I, I would ask you to put yourself into the shoes of the patient um, and say, what would you want? Um, what would you want to know? And this comes with the limitations is that some of, you know, the more that we, the more that we learn about ultrasound as, and as the technology gets better, we are going to find more normal variants and there could be signs or, you know, indicators of certain conditions. And some of those haven't been well validated. And so we don't want to also give, you know, information to a patient that's going to cause excessive anxiety when it's not a valid sign. Um, so there has to be a recognition when you communicate about the limitations of a particular sign. But at the same time for a neur neural tube defect, I think there is. I mean, uh, one, uh, we would bring them back sooner than um, uh, 19 weeks. For example, you could, you could actually um, see, you should be able to see the actual spinal defect in most patients by about 16 weeks. Um, you know, I think if you, you think that uh, and, and, you know, pregnancy termination is a choice um, and uh, for, for women uh, emotionally and also from a procedural and, and physical perspective, earlier termination of pregnancy may be safer and, and also something that is um, more acceptable. Um, and as well in terms of genetic testing, for example, a spinal defect is associated with genetic syndromes. It allows us the opportunity to do appropriate genetic testing via amniocentesis or um, uh, Coriolis villus sampling, meet with genetics and have results back because some of the um, genetic panels will take a number of weeks to come back. So I guess the answer is yes, we want, the whole goal is to have earlier diagnosis, but at the same time, we have to recognize the uh, limitation. Uh, fetal therapy, fetal surgery is another option uh, or is another um, reason why we'd want to have a, an early diagnosis so that patients are not left having to make decisions um, that are life-changing in a very, um, you know, short period of time. Um, so, um, and then uh, uh, a nice question here um, uh, about gut, mid-gut herniation. What if you see it at 12 weeks? If you have a, like a 12 and zero or 12 and one, are you gonna call it as an emphalocele or are you gonna call it mid-gut herniation? So what I do in that case on my tech worksheet is I query abdominal or like emphalocele versus mid-gut herniation. But I do believe that it is uh, protocol to try to bring that patient back because it is very rare for a mid gut hernia to persist um, at 12 weeks. However, I have seen them, I have scanned them, um, and then they come back within even just within a few days or a week and it's not there anymore. So I think you really have to be cautious when you are calling an unphalocele an because that is a, there's a significant difference, obviously. So um, that's how I feel about it. Uh, but from a sonographic perspective, that's what I would query this versus that. But I would, uh, when I'm presenting my case to the radiologist or perinatologist, I would say, this is the crown rump length. And um, so, yeah, and then it would be, you know, I, I do think they would probably bring them back. Yeah, I, I agree. By 13 weeks, you shouldn't see it. Occasionally, mm -hmm. you'll still see it around 12 weeks, so early 12 weeks. Um, and then a uh, question here about nuchal translucency in multiples. Uh, yes, um, as we discussed earlier for monochorionic twins, uh, it's actually not only aneuploidy, but nuchal translucency can be an indicator of congenital anomalies or uh, risk factor for twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. And for uh, dichorionic twins or triplets, then yeah, use, uh, you, you are doing the same um, aneuploidy screening, so the nuchals and the nasal bone and uh, blood work if you do first trimester screening. Mm -hmm. So um, some great uh, questions and there's still some more in the chat if you want to answer them back. Sure. And thank you sure. so much, Michelle, such great work, so much. I mean, I just want to Thanks. put it out to not just Michelle, but everybody today is that, uh, you know, people weren't paid to do these presentations and the presentation itself is only um, a small um, portion of the actual uh, time that it takes to put these presentations together in terms of collecting images, you know, doing background reading and the and the IT perspective, etc. So um, everybody is here today because they're passionate about improving obstetrical imaging and um, are passionate about bringing it to everybody uh, out there. So thank you, Michelle. <music>